there moments in your life, what I call aha moments, where you sort of felt like you were somewhere in your roles in business and said, you know, it's time. It's time to make a left turn, a right turn, a U-turn, any kind of turn. Um, and you sort of had to proactively sort of start to seek what that next move was for you. I've had so many of those junctures, but I think one that's particularly relevant, and I get a lot of, um, I try to help a lot of people in the same situation is I had been very fortunate to work at Microsoft and then at Expedia, which was owned by Microsoft at this time. Mm. Expedia spun out and went public. I went with Expedia and I was exhausted. So I took a break. I got remarried and I retired for a little while. I got remarried. I had another baby and I took myself completely out of the workforce, which at the time I thought was great until I got really bored. And a friend of mine said, you're really boring. You're like a parked Ferrari. Yeah. Get out. You need to go get a job because I can't, I can't talk to you anymore in a nicer way. Right. (laughs) She was quite accurate. What a great friend. Pivot point. And I had to go back to work and I had missed a whole chunk of the business world and development. And I had two kids at this point and I was terrified, but I did it. And it was really a a force of will, I think. And I had to pretend I wasn't scared. And there were a lot of people that helped me along the way. And I'm very grateful to them. Um, Jane Buckingham actually gave me a, 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 a role at, doing some consulting back in the day. And then I ended up working for CAA um, with a longtime colleague of mine, Joe Kessler. But I I had to really reinvent my entire way I thought about myself, much less reinvent how I presented to people. That was that was the double whammy. Right. So such an interesting statement. And it's one where I'm going to kind of pause for a moment because I think so many people sort of get to that point, but then it's the big question of how, how do you, how do you lean into that process for yourself? It sounds good in theory, but you know, what, what did you have to do that self-actualization, those moments of reflection? You know, I always talk so much about listening to ourselves and being aware of the voice in our head that we sometimes ignore. We sweep things under the rug and, oh, I'm fine. And this is all good. And I'm going to keep going instead of really listening and, and allowing ourselves that, what I call entitlement to sort of pause, change, pivot, and do something about it. So are you aware, do you remember really like in the moment, what that process was for you to do that? Well, it brings up a really good point and I'll get back to that, but listening to your gut is the most important skill that I think we're trained not to do, especially as women. Yeah. And as I've gotten older and a little bit more confident in myself as a professional, and I guess as an adult, I don't really think of myself as an adult, but the idea of listening to my gut and and acting based on what I believe, obviously taking input. And I don't want anybody to think, oh, well, you know, I, I, you're not a lone wolf and no, but when I, the times I've gotten into trouble personally or in business is when I ignored my gut. Yeah. So that goes back to the bravery or fear, or whichever side of the coin you look at it. But my gut was telling me to get back out there and my friend, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I just started talking to people and I took a few opportunities that didn't end up being right. There were consulting gigs. What I did do though, was I was really transparent and I put my story out there and I was somewhat, it was like dating almost. And I guess LinkedIn, I don't think LinkedIn was a factor, but I guess LinkedIn is now like the, um, okay, Cupid of uh, yeah. job hunting, right? Right, right. Swipe right, swipe left. But we didn't really, that wasn't really as much of a thing, but I, I talked to everybody and I took, my job search was like a job in the sense that I started very practically. I carved out um, an hour every day, five days a week. And then it became two hours every day, five days a week. And by the end of the month, you put in a good chunk of time And people were really open to at least just having conversations with me. And I was not proud. I I took 
everything that I could do. And, you know, I wasn't making any money, but I used that as an opportunity to learn what other people were doing and then figure out what skills I needed to fix and update. Cause in yeah. five years you, yeah. you lose a, a lot, lot of happens. skills, right? But it was very, it was a combination of being methodical and really spending time listening to my gut. I would read, I read a lot and I would go on to articles and trade publications. And if there was somebody or something that caught my eye that I had that sort of aha moment of like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I would put it on a list and then work to tra track that person down and see yeah. if I could talk to them. So there, like, for example, there's a woman um, named Luann Brizendine mm -hmm. and she is a neuropsychiatrist who wrote a book at the time and she had just written the female brain and then, and she also wrote the male brain. And I was so fascinated. It just did something to my, like my gut. And I tracked her down and wanted to talk to her. And she gave me great advice and she sent me on a path. And it, it was kind of like a pachinko machine or a pinball machine. You kind of yeah. go like this and then you go another place. Yes. And I just went with it. I didn't, I did not have a destination in mind. Right. And ultimately, you know, it's luck. And well, you, you really committed to yourself. You, you I, made yeah. a job out of doing that, which is pretty extraordinary. I and I think there's I a lot to learn from that. That's a huge takeaway. I mean, people sit around not, not doing that kind of work and expecting things to show up. You really well, created it. I, I, yeah, I guess, I guess I did. That's really kind. Yes, I, I did. And I had to deal with a lot of ego stuff because I remember prior to that, I was like, I, I owned my own house. I was working at Microsoft and I was right in the epicenter of things. And then I would go on this round. Like, so what have you been doing? I've been a mom and doing volunteer work. Great. Okay. Nice. And nice. You see people like when you got seated next to them at a dinner party and people would ask, what are you, what are you doing? And when I would say, oh, I'm working at Microsoft, people would light up. And then yeah. when I was not doing that and people were like, oh yeah. Okay. Who else can I go sit next to? Yes. Who can I sit next to? <laughs> And I remember those people. Oh, yeah. I've got them on my list. I know yeah. who they are. Yeah, yeah. No, it's so true. Well, it's so interesting. I mean, I've had this conversation with many a people, many with, with whom you know, and you and I both know. And there is something interesting about that whole point. Your identity is attached to your job title or where you work. And when that goes away, you really start to understand who are the people in your warm, warm circle and who aren't. And it's unfortunate, but it's it's kind of a part of reality, but look, the business network and the business community, I think, you know, where you really leaned in and you really pursued what you felt was the right thing for you is really what it comes down to at the end of the day. And that curiosity in you and finding ways to enhance the skills. I mean, something we're all looking at as we get older is, you know, are we aging out of jobs? And a lot of conversation that we're having at the moment with a lot of our colleagues is, something I think I coined yesterday called aging in instead of yeah. aging out, we are now aging in. Right. This is the world of opportunity where remote and hybrid companies actually need adult supervision. And by adult, I mean, those of us who are a little bit older, who've been around for quite some time, who may have a greater skill set to get their arms around what the hybrid version of the workplace now means. Because we have to bring some of the old school approach to running a business day to day, nine to six in an office with people and what happens in that environment with the virtual experience that so many people are now having. So what's happening is we're seeing an increase in adults being required <laughs> to be at the helm of some of these companies and in senior leadership roles to help manage that in a way that keeps it really cohesive. So I don't know what if you're seeing a lot of that at the moment at Whaler or some of the clients you work with or conversations you're having, but are you kind of seeing a bit of that, of what I'm, I'm now calling aging in? Uh, now that I've got the name for it, which I'm going to borrow and I will credit you, Kathy, uh, you. I love that. I think I was hired at Whaler because I am a grown up, although I don't really feel like one, but I think I am the oldest person at the company. We're mostly in our, most of the people at the company are in their 20s. And one of the things that I think is, we, I mean, we obviously have some senior executives that are fantastic. Right. Yeah. Uh, but you can do your, you can do a 
a, a whole head game on yourself. And it, I think the idea of staying relevant can be very intimidating. But what I find is actually the, the counterforce to that is that I'm not competitive the way I used to be. I I've been through some shit. And it yeah. makes you have some perspective because even when I was in my forties, I thought I knew everything. Yeah. And I realized now I knew, you know, I, it's, it's not even, that's just. Well, the, you did at the time. It was contextual. I, I mean, yeah. really. But I think the idea, the one thing that I find really sort of unfortunate for younger people that, you know, are working in a hybrid environment is that there is a lot of contextual mentoring that you pick up by being around it. Now, I don't miss going to an office every day, just yeah. like many people don't, yeah. but I do love being around my colleagues. And sometimes, like for example, I'm in LA, we don't have an office here anymore because we outgrew it and we're trying to figure that out, but I'll host just work days in my house yeah. so that we're just all together. Yeah. And I think for younger people, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that they're not getting some of that mentoring and experience. Yeah. And I, I sort of, I'm a big fan of being around my team and having them here. And I'm thrilled. I've got a whole summer internship program that I run every year. And I asked everybody that I interviewed, where would you like to work from? And I know what I wanted the answer to be, but I really just wanted to kind of survey how these young people are feeling because I think we're hearing degrees of that. Every one of them wanted to come into the office, which was thrilling to me because I'm, I'm all about wanting to be in the office, you know, most of the time, or if I'm not out on the road traveling. Um, and after the last two years, I hope I'd never have to work at home. Again. <laughs> so I don't mind if I have to do some work while I'm at home, but um, no, running a business, I definitely want to be here. But I find it fascinating the, you know, the conversation right now that's being had. And we just actually hosted a virtual chat event yesterday where that was a big topic. And another one about three weeks ago with some key executives from some major companies. And it's just fascinating to hear the, the you know, the, the thought around what's good for the company, what's good for the company culture, what's good for people, what's good for your employees, and the different ages and stages that people are at and where and why they're responding the way they are.